Tell Me About It. I'm your host, Matt McCourt, and your guest tonight is, all the way from Italy, Anthony Drago. Thanks for being here, and please visit U.S. Mental for more links and scheduling and everything else. So, hi, everybody. I'm Matt McCourt, and welcome to Tell Me About It. Today, we're talking all across the uh, rivers, the world, to my friend Anthony Drago in Italy, Roma, and uh, I uh, sent him to a walk in open air. I can't remember what year it is. I think it was 2003. We finally met in 2009 in Hamburg, Germany, and he's a great guy. He's a singer. He's a record label guy with L.A. Riot Survivor Records, and um, welcome to the show, Anthony. Hi, Matt. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Can you hear me out there? Yes, I can hear you fine. All right. It's great to see you again after so long, man. It's been quite... It's it's great to see, actually. I've been pretty much blind for the last year and a half. I I couldn't use a computer for a long time, but I have... I get shots in my eyeball to stop the bleeding. I guess what they say about uh, wanking is true. <laughs> and I've been doing it since I was 10. <laughs> it took a while, but <laughs> yeah. I've been going to acupuncture. Uh, I know about your uh, recent struggle with health, and I give you my best wishes. You're such a strong guy, and you sh- you're proving this to the world. So... Thank you very much. Grazie. Grazie, prego. (laughs) Prego. What does that mean? They have a a pasta sauce in America called prego. Yeah, prego is a typical Italian expression to say you're welcome or uh, have a seat, uh, put yourself comfortable. Oh, so how long have you been living? You were living in London. How long have you been living back in Italy? Well, I am I moved to London, it was about 2015, and unexpectedly. And since there, I've been living in London. For the past two years, I've been moving here and uh, I've been sorry. I've been living in Italy and also in London. I, I just spent uh, six months in London recently. Now I'm back in Italy, so I'm back and forth. And you're in a new band called Admiral? Yeah, great. Thank you for mentioning that. Admiral is my new band. Is, yeah. that a, is that a brand new band or is it one you joined that was already going? Well, let me tell you, after so many years with all this reunion of historical band, which I've been the singer. Now I finally managed to create my own band with my own music. And so this is fantastic. I, maybe I should have done this a uh, long time ago, but I'm really happy about it. It's my own band, my brand new band with such great, cool musicians. And, and I'm so happy about it. It's so exciting. I feel like a teenager with a with a new toy. Great. You, yeah. When I met you, you were singing with the Raff, and then Fingernails. That's uh, that's who you were with in uh, Germany, and uh, Admiral. That's higher up, higher ranking than a sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I've been singing with those historical band, uh, let's say Caledon from Rome, which was a, which is a, a power metal band. Then I moved to the Raff, which was, they were a, such a famous band in Rome in the eighties. They used to play in America to, together with rock power. And uh, they, they made this reunion and I became to be the singer. And then Fingernails, which has been a long ride. Uh, lots of records, lots of tour in Europe. Uh, a long, long, long story. Very nice, cool story. And then finally, after 
long i mean i was in london i started writing song my new songs i took my time uh, and finally i got the music for admiral i i when i was singing for mayhem in 1985 we played with the raw power and i think your drummer fabio was a drummer with raw power and he told me that they say that uh, punk rock guy tom pig from poison idea and he charged up he was worried that he was tom was not going to like him because he charged up a long distance phone bill to italy and i said don't worry he goes why and i said he died four years ago <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's so typical. People, especially in the 80s, you know, those long distance, so expensive calls. Yeah. And uh, big trouble uh, every time, you know. <laughs> I used to call, I used to talk to Shep Gordon, who was Alice Cooper's manager and er, uh, everybody's manager. He taught me everything I know about uh, publicity. Him and the guy who produced my first album, Andy McKay. But my mom didn't let me forget you owe me this, you charge up this money for long distance. <laughs> so, it was, yeah. yeah, it was, it was crazy. But I that couldn't was, get it. And no what's up, up, you know? Now you can talk, I can talk to people in Japan or in, in UK or in America. And now we, we can see each other like we're doing right now, you know, across the world and it's free. Yeah, that's amazing. Let me yes. put this off, and I can see you. Yeah, these are full color. I love your, I love your set down there, man. Thank you. I, I like the psychedelic. <laughs> well, I'm a, a long time hippie since I was like eight years old. I used to have Nehru jackets and peace signs in second grade. That was when I was eight years old, and uh, I liked the Beatles and all that, Sergeant Pepper's and psychedelic and I actually took LSD my first time when I went to a Catholic high school. <laughs> uh, yeah, the whole class did. A friend, a classmate, his brother, Brian Spooner, played in the tubes in San Francisco. And he came home for Thanksgiving and he brought a bunch of, like, Grateful Dead LSD. And Brian brought some to school and... We were in the bathroom. He said, here, take a half a hit. We're all going to take one today and we'll all trip all, the whole day because your homeroom class would travel to every class all day long. And so we are all tripping. <laughs> it was it was great. It changed my life. It changed the way I thought about everything. It's great. I, I like do. it. So I, I've been a hippie ever since <laughs> I was 14 yeah, and... I I had the chance to see Grateful Dead live in uh, Chicago. I was living in Minneapolis. Wow. The Twin Cities, because I have great friends up there. And then the friends of friends were traveling with a van to Chicago to see the Grateful Dead. And I, of course, I, I went along, I, I went with them. And uh, in the ticket that was included attached the acid wow on the ticket yeah <laughs> i like about five songs to by the grateful dead a lot of them i don't care for too well but i like i really respect their following and their legacy i didn't realize that jerry garcia died when he was 58 that's that's all he was i thought he was much older but they're from the yeah. town that we recorded Dr. Mastermind and Wild Dogs. Uh, it's like 10 miles up the road, Palo Alto. But, oh, uh, so close. Yeah. All right. So there's a lot of, in fact, at the studio that we recorded, Prairie Sun Studios, um, there was a hippie girl that was like, that minded the place. It was, it was like a large ranch that had a gate. I thought we were real special. I'd recorded there in 1980 with my friend Kip Dorn, who was in my band, Evil Genius. And yeah. I thought, wow, you have to ask for permission to get through the gate. And uh, <laughs> they were called Harlow. I played guitar, but I didn't move down there because I would have had to get a job and I'm not employable at the time. But anyway, <laughs> Let's talk about you. 
Have you seen Dirk or uh, Korea from Costume uh, oh, wow. Black? Okay, let me tell you. I, with my label, uh, El Riot Survivor Records, you know, uh, it's based in, based in London. Because since I moved to London, you know, I managed to make, make things more professional. And uh, our next release is going to be Korea New Comeback Album. I really like Stone Cold Black. That was a, that drummer was amazing, and we got to use their uh, practice place when I was in there in Hamburg in 2009 with Zuzu and Robert Browning on drums. And man, I that that's a great band. And Dirk, Dirk Corman. Yeah, they're great friends. I'm still in contact with them. I've been many times to Hamburg again, uh, over and over. I remember in 2019, there was a great occasion. I was in London and uh, they were playing at the Affengebustag. Basically, they have this great celebration of the Arbor in Hamburg with all boats coming from all over the world and people and stalls, markets. And in St. Pauli, as you know, the, the crazy area, they make uh, like an anti-festival and they were playing on the street. And I just flew there without saying anything to my friends. I wanted to make a surprise. And uh, I found myself in the streets of Hamburg with a beautiful day of sunshine with thousands of punk punks on the street. And, and there, I wa there I was and they were so surprised to see me, you know. And we had a great time. They made, they played live. So I'm so happy to announce you that I'm releasing really soon the new album of Stone Cold Black, which is going to be called Super Loud. And it's, man, this album, it's amazing. And also, let me tell you, you know Zuzu, the guy who played with you with Wild Dogs? Yes. The American guitar player. The, oh, yes. He's involved in the album. He also wrote some lyrics and and something, you know. I love great. those those guys. They just uh, some uh, Steffi from Ham, uh, Headbangers Open Air said, "You're coming over to Germany. You know how Germans are. You're coming over to Germany if I have to pay for your ticket." And then I got there, and Dirk and Korea said, "You're playing at a festival tomorrow <laughs> 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 with you and." Uh, uh, anthrax singer, Death Riders, and uh, Enforcer. Yeah. And I said, I don't have a band. They said, Yes, you do. <laughs> and said, These guys. So we that we rehearsed just that one time for like an hour, and then uh, played the gig. It was great. And they, I'm still real good friends with Robert Brown. He just commented on his long Santa Claus beard. <laughs> He's got a beard that's really long. I said. <laughs> I said, hey, I'm hungry. Can I have some leftover gravy or soup in your beard? <laughs> he, has a, he has a great sense of humor. Very dry. But Zuzu, wow, he went through some bad times too. Yeah, my health problem, I, you know, I had blood pressure. It was 289 over 169, which is really high, I found out. I didn't know. And the doctors were around and said, wow. I said, wow, I'm popular. And he said, well, we haven't ever seen anybody alive with blood pressure as high as you. And I go, I, I, oh, I'm okay. And he said, yes, you're, a, you're a, a record holder. I said, I would like my picture on the wall. I'd like a trophy. Now how about some flowers? And they said, if you survive and walk out of here, well, think about it. How did you get here? And I said, oh, my girlfriend dropped me off. I walked in. You walked in? Well, Yeah. <laughs> So I spent Christmas in the hospital. They had great food, but I'm much better now. 100 pounds lighter, and my blood pressure is like at least, uh, it was like one, it's an average is 115 over like 70, which is normal, but I don't drink, I don't, don't drink, I don't eat crap, I exercise all the time, and uh, <laughs> you know, it's much better, but um uh, that was a great time. I I really had a good time. I love Germany. I've got the t German flag tattooed on my arm because those people have always been Wild Dogs fans from the 
the start, and uh, that didn't happen in America. In fact, in my hometown, they would pay us $8 to headline a show. At the end of the night, they say, well, this is all we could pay you. And we had three guys. And I said, can you make it nine? Because I can't divide eight <laughs> by three. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, so I, I quit playing in 2018. We're, I'm in a, we're in a book called Northwest uh, Rusted Metal, about the Northwest heavy metal and rock scene. But they're all, the people up here are the last to know about everything. Everybody at tours... Like Ingve had a band from Seattle on the tour. They came up to the California border and went east. They didn't even come to Oregon or Washington. But uh, I wonder why. Uh, it's such a nice place up you know, there where uh, you live. So it, I wonder it, why there's no lack of support and many, many good bands. It's so nice that are. nobody goes out. <laughs> like, uh, you know. Raven was here and they got like 40 people and Business Rumors was here and they got like 20 people and Anvil came and they got like 30 people. Hey, speaking of Raven, John Gallagher has been on the show twice and he's my friend since 1984 when we played with Anthrax and them, headlining. And uh, how I met him was great. We were in a bar behind the venue and he came, he came in, and my friend said, if I start a bar, I'm going to call it Bunch of Booze. And so John came in and said, hi, mate. Uh, what's good to drink here? And I said, well, John here came up with a, a drink called Bunch of Booze. So he said, I'll have one of those. And we all laughed but and told him it was a joke. And so we drank our beers. Went back over to the venue, and he says, I've got to go to the bathroom. Please show me where it is. And so I showed him. We walked in the bathroom, and he went to sit down. I thought, you know, I can sit down, <laughs> you know, to take a poop. <laughs> and we kept talking. And I thought, I'm going to love this guy forever because nobody talks in the bathroom. We just kept talking. He, that guy is such a nice guy, you know, as you already know, because you – did something with him, recorded with John, didn't you? Well, this is a great story. I always been a Ray, a fan, Ray, a Raven fan, fan, sorry, my, and since I, uh, the age of 14. And so it happened that I was setting up, uh, assembling this great uh, Raven tribute because there's a never been a Raven tribute ever before. So I, it took me years of work and I created this Raven tribute with all great bands from all over the world. And uh, I met John in Lübeck at Dirk's festival. And I told him about this uh, and he was so kind. And he told me, Anthony, I say, I'm gonna put my new band in this and all the rest of the band are known, but my new band is going to be, we're going to do live at the Inferno. And he, he sang with me. So we, we have this duet online, which is basically the first Admiral release ever is live at the Inferno Raven cover from the All for Raven tribute. And I sing together with John Gallagher. So he has been super cool and super nice with me and i recently been to london and they were playing at the black heart in camden town and we hang out uh, lovely they're fantastic the best band and the coolest people yes i love john and mark and their new drummer mike heller just is amazing the last two albums are the only albums i bought for years uh, metal city and all hills breaking loose and they're on tour now with Girl School and Alcatraz. That's going to be probably a, a, an alcoholic fest. But they are. we played with them in 2020, 2010. And they said, don't go to that little dressing room. Come use our dressing room with us. And we joked so much and talked about the mentors. Who were, I'm going to interview the the bass player, Heathen Scum, tomorrow on, on this and uh, we were talking about the mentors. I've recorded six albums with that with that guy called the Church of Bel Duty. And yeah. uh, we were joking so much and talking, singing the mentor songs. We didn't tune up. And they came to get us and said, 
you guys are on stage, so get out here. So we walk out on stage, and the guitar player and I, I was playing bass, we started the first song, and about halfway through, we realized that he, I'm in a completely different tuning than him and out of tune, and so was he. I said, wait a minute, can we do an, a do-over? <laughs> so we stopped the show, tuned up, and knocked him dead. They had me on stage with uh, to play Born to be Wild. Yeah, that's yeah. Mark is, I didn't realize Mark, a building fell on him, a construction site. A building fell down on him and totally destroyed him. He was really in bad shape. And he said, I think that happened in 2000. And so it took a while for him to get better. But, you know, I don't, I'm an only child, so I really respect the, the brothers that uh, do it. And they've been doing it. This is their 40th year. 50th. 50 yeah. years. Yeah. This year. So... LA, yeah. LA riot survivors. That's a long email, <laughs> but yeah, we we played my Motorhead tribute played on the Motorhead compilation, Motorhead tribute compilation that you put out. That was, that was pretty good. Yeah, that was the first ever tribute that I managed to to set up, and uh, the label was still in Rome at the time. So we also, there are many cool bands on that. There is Fingernails, my ex-band, there are so many. Also a very young version of Evil Invaders, which they, you know, now they are so famous, but remember when we played in Hamburg, they were like, they so just started, you know, and it's amazing, you know, we, we had this great tribute with Wild Dogs. Your cover is the be one of the best of the album. Uh, and yeah, I'm very proud of that release. And it took me years to make another tribute album, actually the Raven tribute. So uh, it's amazing, yeah. That was a great band with Vito. And Vito, he used to, he grew up on the island of... Uh... Sardinia, our guitar player. Excuse me? Who are you talking our, about? Our guitar player, Vito Sin. He uh, ah, grew up. Vito. On, he, yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. He grew up on the island of Sardinia in Italy. Oh, my God. I, I didn't know about that. Yeah. And the, Dave Hathaway, he was like my best friend in the world. He died in 2020, the same week I got Bell's palsy. Corona, COVID really was bad for me. I lost my job. I woke up one morning and my face was on my chest. I couldn't, it was paralyzed. I don't know what happened, but <laughs> I've been talking funny ever since. And I, I just did a bunch of TV shows. I figured the only way to rehab is to talk. I figured this is messing up my talking. And I'm sure somebody out there was not too unhappy with me it's not talking okay because people always tell me to shut up. Well, I don't get a lot of support in my hometown, but that that Motorhead band was so great, and uh, I really, I, by that time, I was really sick of playing Wild Dog songs, and nothing will ever <clears throat> be like the the original Wild Dogs with Dean Castanovo and Jeff yeah. Mark and Danny. We had a really cool band. It was really big time. You know, Journey, or Dean plays with Journey. You, uh, also, Dean plays with many, many famous names. Also, if I'm not wrong, he played with this Italian rock star, super famous uh, pop star Vasco Rossi as well. Yes. Oh, you say Vasco Rossi? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there's so a, you, you can't imagine. There's a network, uh, a movie about him on Netflix or Amazon. And uh, yeah, he said, I ate so much spaghetti and pizza. <laughs> and he got paid, <laughs> but he said they were playing like, you know, gigantic stadiums, soccer stadiums. Yeah. That's also, true. Dean also played with Ozzy Osbourne on yeah. the Osmosis album and Bad Lincolns. And uh, I'm kind of a big reason why he got into the big time. I found him in 1982 when 
Chip Doran, my guitar player from Evil Genius, and Jay Reynolds from Malice went to go see. He, Kip said, you got to go see this kid playing drums. He's amazing. He's like Neil Peart. So we went to this club. There's about five people there. And his drum set was so big, the other guys had to play on the, the dance floor. It took up that much room. He had timpani, timpani drums, gongs, and this gigantic drum set. And then we just hit it off like you know brothers. And uh, a week later, a couple weeks later, we did the Malice demos that got them onto Memo Blade Records. And uh, he didn't want to join the band, so he came to jam with Wild Dogs, and he totally destroyed... The the drum kit that was there was owned by Jamie St. James of Black and Blue, and he broke uh-huh. the he he brought broke the footboard pedal the kick pedal footboard in half. He played so hard, he punched through the bass drum, ruined all the heads, totally destroyed the snare, and he goes, "Okay, man, I gotta go." <laughs> and the other guys in my band, I said, "Well, what do you think? Uh, he's too fat. He's too young. He overplays. He plays too loud." And we will never be able to control him. And I said, I can't find anything wrong with that. And uh, they didn't want him. But I pushed him in the band because I thought this guy's great. But uh, on Dr. Mastermind, after Wild Dogs had replaced me, uh, the label, Mike Barney, said, see if we can get Dean. I said, if I get Dean, can you hire him as a session musician? Because he needs to get paid. And so he said, yes. He'll join Tony McAlpine's band and then do sessions. And I said, okay, then I'll pay for it out of my budget to move him to California. And so he did. And they were practicing across the hallway from Neil Sean's band, Heart Bad English. And uh, they said, hey, <laughs> anybody that heard him said, hey, come play with us. And so he did. And from then it just took off, I guess, you know, a shot. He played on so many albums. I love the guy. He's like a brother. He he sends me pictures from the Journey plane. Speaking of planes, have you seen Mickey D on Instagram? Which plane was Scorpions? No, actually, I missed that. I oh, didn't he, know he was playing with Scorpions. Oh yeah, he uh, after Lemmy died, he uh, joined Scorpions, and uh, that guy is so cool. He let me shoot. Him right next to his drum kit when I shot Motorhead. Oh, there you go. That's my phone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I, I get so much spam calls. Yeah. What do you want? Yeah. Hello, Cleveland. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, I said that. And you said that uh, when we were playing in Germany. <laughs> I remember actually that the 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 festival was called the Nightmare over São Paulo, and it was a true nightmare because we <laughs> we had this drummer, and uh, you know Korea um, gave us hospitality the full week. At the hostel, the Jolly Roger, which is the hostel of the football club people, you know. Mm-hmm. And one night we had an argument with our original drummer. And basically next morning we woke up and he was gone. <laughs> he was gone to Sweden. And we had like two shows to, you know, some shows and we had no drummer. So the night we were supposed to play... And we were at the last day of the festival and I found some guy on the street from Chile. Wow. Was that and I told him, man, can you play double bass? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got him to listen to a couple of songs and I said, just play fast and straight. And we ended up making a kind of a jam. That guy was amazing. I never see him again. After the show, he just walked away. He was a young guy. But thank God, after that, we came to, we been, we went back to Rome and we found this young drummer, Carlo El Charlo, which completely changed the history of the band because he used to play so fast, like nobody ever could. And from then to on, we had an amazing time uh, traveling all over Europe with this young drummer playing so fast. And, and 
my band bandmates couldn't play. It was so fast even for their fingers. And I was happy to to sing Ria, you know, hey girl, you're on the city, put your mind right on sale, I swear, I swear, I swear. And it was amazing, you know. But thanks to that concert in Hamburg, we lost the origin the, the first drummer, man. Was that Fabio? Yeah. <laughs> Who? Was that Fabio? Your, uh, your original his, drummer? His name was uh, Fabrizio. Oh. And he left the band. He just uh, left. Left. That, went back. Left the tour. Was that the raw power drummer? No, 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 no. Not at all. So also, I wish he was. When uh, <laughs> what year did I get you passes for Vakan Open Air? Was that two thousand three? Two thousand two and two thousand three, because oh. I, I've been twice on behalf of U.S. Metal TV. Portland, Oregon, Maccom Entertainment. Here we go, Wagen. <laughs> and you know, uh, we had this great occasion. Thanks to you, I'm I'm truly grateful. And we've been backstage with all the best bands from Scorpions to everybody. And I was traveling with Katie Monique, which was my girlfriend at the time. And uh, we had a great time filming and and basically, our report was that was just our drunk, uh, drinking and talking and having fun, you know, at the festival. And waiting for Katie to get ready. Uh, all the time. <laughs> Man, she's she's become a real big film director. She she has two two movies on Amazon, and I talked to her quite a bit online also. She's nice, and I put her on. Uh, she let me put a picture on two of my album covers. I know, I know. That's amazing. She's such a strong, strong, strong person, and she her life is an adventure. I can tell. I can testify. And she, she, she was a punk in her. You know, in teen days, she moved first to Milano. Then she, she lived in Amsterdam with all the punks in the early 90s. Then she decided to become an actress and she came to to Rome and she started, she had a lot of uh, acting roles in theater and movies, but as you said, in the recent year, uh, she became a director and I'm so happy because uh, her movie was shown around the world. She won so many uh, how do you say it? Awards. Prizes? Awards, yeah. So I, I'm really glad. I mean, yeah, she, she deserved that. She's she's, cool. a, she's a true rocker. She's a sweetie. I like her a lot. I like to get her on the show to talk about her movies. And, uh, yeah. She, yeah, she interviewed uh, Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister at Bakken. That's on the yeah, video. You, you, you made... Sorry. You, well, that's okay. You made the the show of you going to Bakken Open Air and send it to me. And then that's been playing on local TV ever since. Like they, wow. at the the studio, the playback facility, they have play. they keep playing all my old shows. And that's, uh, I love that place. Uh, Open Signal TV really changed my life to begin with. I made me, it got me to go to college and learn how to do film and video. And when Corona, COVID as we call it here, was closed down, I turned in 900 shows. I was the only, they, they called it Matt TV. They took one guy did. <laughs> Cause I was like one of the only people who could actually produce shows at my house. And like I'm doing now. Yep, I'm yeah. that guy who lives in his mom's basement. <laughs> One day, maybe I'll make money at it. I used to work at a college, which paid me pretty good, but uh, when COVID came, that went away. <laughs> like I said, COVID ruined my life. But um, let's see here. Yeah, speaking of Milan, I've done a lot of interviews and stuff from... Uh, there's a a magazine called Classic Rocks Mag Magazine from Italy. And yeah. this lady named Silvia Mento, she uh, and really, when I couldn't see Hardy at all, she sent me, uh, can I, you know, I'd like to do an interview for you for uh, uh, 80s metal or whatever. And uh, 
So I answered these long questions. It was really hard for me to see. And I had to voice it into my phone and then send her those. <laughs> my typing is bad, but my voice texting is even worse, as you probably can tell from Facebook. <laughs> but uh, no. I, I don't think it's come out yet, but I talked to her quite a bit. She lives in Mil Milano. Or Milan? Milano. Yeah. And um, she also works for a TV station that does sports. Like, okay. I can't remember. The, she covered a big bike race, but uh, she really helped me out. Yeah, she's always on Facebook and Instagram. But uh, anyway, let's see what else is going on. Um, have, have you released anything from Admiral, like an album or a song? Recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I two years ago I released this All for Raven the tribute on vinyl and uh, CD, and we sold a lot, a lot of copies in, uh, especially in Europe, USA, and Japan. In Japan we had uh, sold out, uh, so twice, and also. Uh, since then, I've been releasing another band from London, which is a trio of uh, death technical death metal. Many, many releases. And you're talking about my own, my own music, because yeah. with the label, we are constantly releasing stuff. Uh, then I re I'm guest on... Uh, last year, I've been guest on uh, Dusk album which is an historical band from pakistan and they they had me as a guest on vocal on one track and what else let me think yeah i had two releases in the last two years and i'm definitely working on the debut album of admiral we are entering the studio and it took me some time to build up and find the right people. So I found uh, these guys which are amazing, the rhythm section and the guitar player, and we are we get along real well. So my next release, uh, my personal next release will be uh, Admiral uh, debut album. We, we, uh, we had one song on the tribute, but now it's time for us to release the album so I can go live, you know, and die on stage <laughs> or on, on the road or whatever. <laughs> you know? Die with your boots on. Always. Actually, I, I wear sneakers, but die with, with your sneakers on. <laughs> well, like uh, Mark from the band Manila Road, he yeah. died and he had a heart attack playing Headbangers Open the Air. And... Yeah. Uh, he, they, he died, I think, on the way to the hospital. It, man, it gets so hot on that stage. <laughs> and uh, he's a nice guy. He was on travel. But in America, two of my distributors have closed up. They don't handle any more physical CDs or albums. They said, they told, they get, sent me an email, said, you can pay to have your stock returned to you or we will destroy it for free. <laughs> And the uh, warehouse manager, Craig Montoya, he used to be the, he was the bass player for the band Everclear. And uh, he sent them to me on the side. But their warehouse was so big, you could park a 747 in them. There was, and they had two of my distributors quit because they weren't selling enough. A lot of bands that are playing tours, big labels, they're so far in debt to the label and because of Corona and sales are so low that uh, they've been taking the proceeds from, their, you know, like when you buy tickets, yeah. they take the, the label takes that. And okay. so they're basically paying for playing for money like I get. <laughs> it's probably a lot better than that, but uh it's crazy. It's uh... it's really sad to hear that because you know, but on my personal experience and as far as I can see around me, there are a lot, lot, still lots of people who love to buy physical copies. I don't know. Uh, I've seen from my own sales uh, basically 
uh, the vine, the Raven tribute. I sold so many CDs in Japan and more about vinyls in America and Europe. And also when I was touring with fingernails, we used to sell so many albums at the shows, merchandising, you know, and albums. So I, I believe there's, you know, we are going to an era of, you know, digital nothing, I will call it. But I still see, I still notice uh, sales of physical, and you know, now, for example, if you want to press a vinyl, and I know with my label, there's a long waiting line because uh, press plans are full of orders. So I don't know, someone, I suppose someone buy the albums because if it's, there are so many press plans and they are so busy. I I have, uh, you know, all my, I've got 24 CDs on, 24 albums on CD and I sell through eBay and, 15 years ago, the uh, the sales were really great, but in the last year, it's been so slow. And since uh, 2016, the postal rates are so expensive, it costs $10 to send one CD to Europe. And that killed that whole, you know, most of my fan bases in Europe. So I'm living up to being flourishing in obscurity. <laughs> <laughs> the best kept secret in heavy metal is me. <laughs> I've, I've never made a living and never, never made enough. It always cost me money to play music. But I just wanted to, after going to Amsterdam in 2002 with uh, mentors, Steve Broy yeah. and Kill on Rents, I was an art history student. And Alan said, you like art. Come with me. So we went to Herman Brood's art studio in downtown Amsterdam. And <clears throat> as we were walking in there, this guy was walking out. It was located on top of a bar. And this guy came out and he said, hi. And I said, hi. And I said, that looks just like Bono from U2. And we go up to the art studio and there's a little guy, you know, black turtleneck and little tiny round glasses. And he said, it's a good thing you came when you did. Bono was staying here during the weekend, and we were closed until just a moment ago. I said, it was Bono. And uh, that changed my life. Uh, I saw Herman Brood is a, a guy kind of like Tom Waits. And uh, I didn't think Alan Wrench was into this, but he uh, he was a junkie, and he was a musician, and he was a painter. And his work of... His body of work was on the wall, and you could all the originals. So you could buy prints, and uh, Alan bought like six thousand dollars worth of prints. And uh, I thought, wow, I wouldn't know about this guy if he didn't have a body of work. And so I thought, I'm going to record everything I can, and I'll make music for after I die. And so I recorded like a madman. That's why I have so many albums, and uh, you know, don't know. Nothing is big budget, so it's not the you know state of the art. But I don't own anybody. It uh, I paid for it all myself. So I've got I I've recorded forty two albums since nineteen eighty. Wow. Uh, Twenty four mm -hmm. is like hard rock and heavy metal. The other ones are like funk and jazz and comedy. I got I got into comedy in nineteen ninety when nobody wanted to hear heavy metal up here. I mean, I couldn't get booked for anything. Even with Dean playing in Ozzy Osbourne, um, we'd play to an empty bar. But Dean would come up and say, hey, man, let's play. I'll be up. And he'd bring a drum kit, and uh, we played gigs, but nobody showed up. And so I started doing comedy. I was also married, so I was miserable enough for comedy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, how I, that's how I got into TV. A, a guy, I was going, I went to a Neil Young free concert at the waterfront and I was walking back and this girl that I knew from high school, he said, hi Matt. And her husband, this, her annoying husband said, I'm producing shows. I need somebody to write something. What do you want? I said, Oh, right. with it. So I started writing comedy skits and, uh, he didn't ever pass the classes to 
actually do it. So I called them up and it was free. And so I started going to these classes and so I could use a studio and get my shows played. And I started writing and I was uh, doing stand up comedy at the uh, yeah. comedy clubs. And that's when I created uh, Madison Avenue. And th- how that happened was my ex wife and her friend would l- watch the same five Guns N' Roses videos all the time. And so I had a gig to do. And my friend Buko was going to take me. Actually, Buko took the photograph that's on the inside cover of Live at the Inferno for Raven. Yeah. He took that picture. And uh. so, so I had this band and I, at the same bar that I was drinking with John Gallagher. So I put my hair, I combed my hair over like a side part. It was kind of like this now, but I wore these safety glasses, these big Clark Kent glasses and put a stupid jacket on and grabbed my guitar and went and I showed up at the gig and I said, hi, man can't make it tonight. I'm Madison Avenue and uh, I'm going to play all the songs. I know all the songs and these guys were laughing so hard. And we did the gig and I went across the street to the Starry Night where we played with Raven and I knew everybody there. And I said, hi, I'm late. I'm, I'm sure I'm late. Can you show me up on stage? And I thought they'd recognize me, but they didn't. They walked me up on stage, onto the stage, still with my guitar on me because I didn't have a case. And I've been as explorer. And it was a reggae show, a totally sold out reggae show. And they were changing over the set. And I went up and banged on the mic. Is this thing on? And the sound guy turned the mic on. They turned the house music off, turned the lights off. And so I just started telling stupid jokes. And they all laughed. That's great. And I thought, this is easy. I said, you know, I just wandered in from across the street. I'm not on the show, but I'm, I'm probably at the wrong place. But you guys, will, if you treat everybody like you treated me tonight, you'll never see a bad show. <laughs> You've right. always been an entertainer, man. <laughs> yeah. All, all, even in the metal scene, you know, you always have shows and outfit and some kind of irony. So it, it's in your blood, you know? Yeah. I, I remember I, I used to, I, sometimes I realize I met so, much, so many famous artists. I tend to forget. I remember I was living in the worst street of Hollywood. And when I mean the worst street, I mean uh, junkies, gunshot, police, uh, whatever very very dangerous street and one day i just walked down and there was there michael jackson in his car talking to people and i used to <laughs> i spent like 10 minutes talking to michael jackson in and on the other side of the street and there were there were cops with a gun pointed to some guys <laughs> sitting ducks you know it's unbelievable people don't believe me i believe I be, once i I went to Laurel Canyon, you know, between the San Fernando Valley and Hollywood. Yes. For some kind of jo- job job, or appointment. And the guy, I saw there was this door and I just, a hand slided out like in the horror movies. <laughs> and this guy was the guy from Psycho. <laughs> and I told him, my name is Anthony. And he told, and he said, also, my name is Anthony. I say, I know who you are. Tony <laughs> Perkins. Yeah, you are Anthony Perkins. Uh, so many. Once in Rome, because I used to work in theater. I, I, I'm a technical director in theater. I used to work with Gian Giacomo Ladisa, Ugo Gregoretti, and lots of some great artists in Rome. And one day he called me, Gian Giacomo told me, Anthony, come with me. We have to go to this, in the center, to this big hotel. I say, why? The Dalai Lama is coming. I said, are you serious? And he picked me up with a cab and we rushed there. There were all these monks on the stairs. And we say, can we say hello to the Dalai Lama? And they said, no, 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 no. Then the Dalai Lama came with some girls, you know, like 
not groupies, I mean, some, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, my friend gave him um, a, a, a tiny book of poems that he wrote. And the Dalai Lama smiled and gave us uh, like a scarf, a white scarf that I still have. And uh, I met Shaka Khan in Los Angeles. I like uh, Shaka Khan. And you know, I, when I was uh, 21, I been I was produced by Larry Dunn, which is my great, great longtime friend. Larry Dunn is the original keyboard player from Heart, Wind and Fire. I love Earth and Fire. I love funk music. That's really, I love funk music. That's really Let's what say. I like the best. I, I love to sing funky. I'm a metalhead since the age of 12, but funky music, it's in my blood as well. I always been singing uh, blues and funk. I love it. Me too. I, I, uh, I've got a couple of blues albums out, and when I play drums every day, three times a day, it's always to like... Uh, well, these bands you probably haven't heard Perceptions and uh, uh, Corey Wong and the uh, Dirty Loops and it's all funk and Rick James. Give oh it to me, God. baby. Give it to Rick me. Rick James. <laughs> yeah. Man, Rick James groupie. A Rick James groupie was living in our living room in Hollywood back in 1991. Wow. I, I was living in the same building with Sister Whiskey, which was an amazing Southern rock band from Hollywood. And they had such a huge follow. Then Warner Brothers signed, signed them. And uh, Rick James Groupie was living in uh, my living room. And she was crazy. And she used to go, she used to work in, in every, in ev she used to go to rave parties. She took me there, you know? illegal rave parties and it was amazing man. and one night because i've been produced by this uh, very famous italian international producer beppe cantarelli this guy was living in la he signed me and my friend back in, in the days this guy used to produce arita franklin mariah carey mina which is a huge italian singer so popular and that night we were working with him in the studio and he said, well, hey guys, tonight there is a private show, Shaka Khan, Rick James, Saida Garrett. And I said, where? I said, we're going. And I wasn't, I was less than 21. So I was so afraid they didn't let me in. I, I dressed like, uh, like if I was a big boy, <laughs> like this, a stiff walking and nobody cared about, you know, and, even even sometimes I used to show my Italian ID, which was confusional for them in America because <laughs> we have different way to write things. So I just and I found myself uh, with Shaka Khan, Larry Dunn, Saidia Garrett, Rick James. They were playing in the same night on this big club. I believe we were the only white guys in the club, <laughs> the only white people. <laughs> It was amazing, man. <laughs> so like, many crazy stories. Did, did you like George Clinton? I, here's my George Clinton story. I was watching Robin Trower at the, the Starry Night, and this girl who worked for the concert company said, you know, I was good friends with her, and I said, she goes, I got to go. I'm going to go do the count out for George Clinton at the Paramount Theater. And I go, I'd rather be there. And she said, show up at the back door, Give me 15 minutes to get there and then show up and I'll get you in. So I go and the guy said, hi, Mr. McCord, and walked me oh. in and takes me backstage. It, I, I got treated so good. I was the only white guy backstage and there's a party going on and a, a private bar backstage, like on the stage behind the, you know, it was like on the stage, basically. I was standing there, and George Clinton came over and gave me a big bear hug and walked me backwards out to the stage and then <laughs> did a big sweep with his hand. He didn't even, didn't say anything. And I, so I started dancing on stage with George Clinton and Funkadelic and the guy in the diapers, the guitar player. And I was out there for like 10 minutes, and then... The song was about to end, so he walked me over to the side of the stage and then walked over to the bartender and 
pointed at me and said, give him whatever he wants, I guess, because the, the bartender boasted for me to come over. And what do you want? And so <laughs> that was so great, man, because I, I love, you know, like Atomic Dog and George Clinton and Funkadelic. And man, he was, <laughs> I didn't realize he was, he was, he had a crack problem forever. He even has a, there, I got his book. And he played at uh, Chelsea Clinton, the president's daughter's 16th birthday. And he, and he points out, there, if in my right hand is a crack pipe around George or Bill Clinton <laughs> at the White House. And, uh, oh, yeah. And it's just that kind of music I've always loved. You can, I dance. And, uh, well, Funkadelic, it's amazing. I believe Funkadelic and Heart, Wind and Fire are. Maybe, and of course, uh, James Brown, yeah, but the Funkadelic and Heart in the Fire are the two standards. The dirty street sound of Funkadelic and the amazing, uh, you know, Heart in the Fire is like the Beatles of Funky, you know, with this, those songs full of hope and love, but it's so big, it's so true that it's undeniable, it's, it's real. So when you lit, uh, do you like Snoop Dogg? I really like Snoop Dogg, Doggy Style. That was an amazing album, and Dr. Dre put all those funkadelic uh, clips. That's that's what they rap over. And uh, I listened to that when I first started working at the college, like all nonstop. Snoop Dogg and Madonna, and I wrote parking tickets, so I walked like for six hours a day with Madonna and Snoop Dogg. That's where I got the idea to how to start my label. I had no money, but uh, I knew I wanted to do it. And uh, I did it when I was making $600 a month. To uh, That's how I started my label. I, I, yeah, put, I, I sent a proposal to uh, CD replicators and said, you know, if he offered a, a short run, program you'd get a lot of business and you'd make a lot more money than it when people wanted to buy a thousand and so pretty soon i saw an ad for this factory on uh i forgot where but maybe myspace or no i or on guitar center and uh it put me in business but uh, hey we're coming over on coming up on an hour here so i should probably get going Okay. Anything else you'd like to say to the people out here on Tell Me About It? And thank you for showing up and being on my show. Tell me about it. This is what I'm doing now, and I love it. And um, I really, I miss you, man. You, I'm, I miss the calls on Sunday. Matt, it's Anthony from Roma. You would call <laughs> me and say that. And my mom would, my mom, that's one, uh, you call the house phone. Matt, there's somebody from Roma, Ante. Oh yeah. <laughs> but well, Matt, let me let me tell you. First of all, it's great. Thank you for the interview. Uh, also, it was more like a friendly chat, which I love. And I'm so glad to see you in good shape. And I love this. Tell me about it. And hopefully, uh, there's so many things to say. I just want to say thanks, everybody, for. Uh, for you know, supporting our music, and uh, hopefully, if I start touring with Admiral, who knows? Maybe I can come to Oregon, and we can play together in front of whoever wants to show up. But it will be a chance to see you. Do you have or, a website? Maybe, yeah. Do you have? Me. Do Do you have a? Is there a website I can put up? Yes, please. Uh, connect to my label, uh, LA Riot Survivor, which is a true story because I am an LA Riot Survivor of 1992, you know, Rodney King. And uh, it's uh, LARiotSurvivor.com. Okay, I'll put that also, up. Also, every su Sunday I'm on, on radio. I have a radio show on Sunday from Rome with a very beautiful and talented co-host. She's amazing, Sira Devanna. Hello, Sira. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever see this, watch this. And so, 
please look around for my label, El Riot Survival Records. There's a lot of new stuff coming up and, and also Stone Cold Black, the new album. Our friends, me, Cor uh, sorry, Korea Black is Matt McCourt and Anthony Drago's great friends. So support them. I'll put that up. And yes, that's the whole idea of this whole thing is to just chat with the, my friends. And uh, it's not like, you know, I'm not interrogating you. We're just talking. That's what I like about it. Kind of like what I heard Jerry Seinfeld talk about comedians in cars having coffee. And I thought, yeah, that's that's what my show's about. And uh, oh, by the way, you know, I quit drinking. and I lost half my friends. My double vision cleared up. Yeah, man, you look great. And <laughs> really, I I see you getting better and better. Uh, all my love to you. And lots of people in Europe loves you, you know, from the Internet, you know. Yes. Uh, you have many, many friends here in Europe. We support you. And uh, I really hope to see you personally again. So let me just do this. Admiral. <laughs> And see you in the USA, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. That's going to be the pic cover picture for this show. <laughs> I love right. you too. Mi amore. Is that how you say amore it? Amore mio. Amore mio. <laughs> I love you, Anthony. Thank you so much for being on and uh, making my day and making me smile. And I will tell the world. You. Tell me about it, and I will tell the world. Grazie, Matt. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you so much. <laughs>